Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Jewel Ratzlaff. I'm the Big Read Coordinator, and this is the second in our series of getting acquainted with the graphic novel. Uh, these programs are being recorded, and um, I will be sending out the link to folks who are interested. You can share them. They will live on the Poughkeepsie Public Library District YouTube channel, which you can get to through the website. So I am going to, hey, where did my, why is it only showing me this? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so let me share my screen and hello. This is what I want to share. Here it is from the beginning. There we go. Okay. Phew. Always trepidation, you know, is this really going to work? <laughs> but I think it will. So this is the second in our series of Big Read Exploration of the Graphic Novel. And talking about credentials, well, what gives me the chutzpah to do this? Well, I'm a reader. I'm a Big Read coordinator, so I got to know a little something about what our literature is. And hey, I've recently read a couple of graphic novels. And yeah, well, I'm just a little bee finding my way. So no superhero splash here. I am just going to take you on my layperson's journey of discovery of the graphic novel. Because we all come to the big read with expectations about the literature that the literature is going to be well-written. It's going to have an engaging plot. It's gonna have great characters and probably gonna expose us to something new. So can we meet all of those expectations in the best we could do? I say, yes, we can and more. And I hope by the end of the evening, you will agree with me. So my guidebook in this recent discovery for me of graphic novels is this book called Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. And there are several copies of this floating around the Mid-Hudson Library system. Um, I will say that what I'm gonna talk about tonight just barely skims the surface of the first chapter and a half. It's really in depth and there's a lot of kind of psychological, artistic, you know, nitty gritty that he gets into. It's very interesting if that's what interests you. Otherwise, it might not be your cup of tea. And I hope that I will have pulled out the most important things that um, might interest you. Um, I'm not going to read comics to you all night. I'm just going to do this at the beginning because this is how Scott McCloud starts his book. Setting the record straight is chapter one. And I think it's a great place to start. So we're going to look at this comic here. And I'm going to read it to you. Hi, I'm Scott McCloud. When I was a little kid, I knew exactly what comics were. Comics were those bright, colorful magazines filled with bad art, stupid stories, and guys in tights. I read real books, naturally. I was too old for comics. But when I was in eighth grade, a friend of mine convinced me to take to give comics another look and lent me his connect, lent me his collection, and soon I was hooked. In less than a year, I became totally obsessed with comics. I decided to become a comic artist and practice, practice, practice. I felt there was something lurking in comics, something that had never been done, some kind of hidden power. But whenever I tried to explain my feelings, I failed miserably. Sure, I realized that comic books were usually crude, poorly drawn, semi-literate, cheap, disposable kitty fare. 
but they don't have to be. The problem was that for most people, that's what comic book meant. If people failed to understand comics, it was because they defined comics too narrowly. Proper definition, if we could find one, might give lie to the stereotypes and show that the potential of comics is limitless and exciting. And this is where our journey begins. That is how his book begins. And I just thought it was really appropriate to start our talk this evening. So he's talking about comics. The name of our program tonight uses the term graphic novel. So what's the deal with those terms? So graphic novel was a term that was first, pop, uh, first popped up in literature in 1964. It didn't really catch on until later into the 80s, I would say. Some people use the word comics and graphic novels interchangeably, but they both carry some baggage. Um, and, and we'll get into that as we move along. But tonight, there will be times when I use them interchangeably. Um, last week, our uh, presenter, uh, Melanie Klein mentioned this book, uh, Will Eisner, Contract with God. And when I, when I got it out of the library, there was something interesting in the, uh, just the blurb on the front that said, with the publication of this book in 1978, Will Eisner created a new medium altogether, and it was called the graphic novel. Okay, so, so even in this book, which says 1978, they're saying this was the beginning of the graphic novel. So it's not, it's not clearly defined. It's not, you know, it, there's a lot of fuzzy, uh, fuzziness around these terms. But let's, let's dig in a little bit. What do we mean by this stuff we're talking about, comics or graphic novels? The basic, basic, basic definition is it's sequential art. In other words, it's multiple panels of drawings or photography that are purposefully sequenced and often have words and there's a plot. So there's the point of it is to tell, to, to sell, uh, tell a story. So in other words, we're not talking about a single panel cartoon like Family Circus. It, there has to be a multiple set of a sequence of panels, okay? So there are some examples here uh, going from short to long. A, the Sunday comic strip. Okay, one comic strip could be, you could meet our definition, it's sequential art. It's really, really short and there's not much plot. It's generally just a joke, right? But you could say, yeah, that's comics, right? Well, let's make it a little bit longer. B, what about an Archie and Veronica comic book? Okay, it has multiple pages. There might even be a couple of short stories in it, right? It's sequential art, it's multiple panels. There's a purpose to the sequence. There's words, there's plot, it's telling a story. C, a book of art panels and text that's long enough to need a bookmark. In other words, it's a major story, okay? It's long enough to be really, really heavy. Oh my goodness, I'm carrying around a couple of copies of this book, uh, the best we could do. They're really heavy. There's a lot of paper here and paper weighs a lot. And voila, we call this a graphic novel simply because it's long, okay? It's they're all sequential art. Casper the Friendly Ghost is sequential art. Back, Batman and other superhero things are sequential art. These comics, a modern romance comic book. Okay, science fiction comic book, private eye murder mystery book, fantasy comic books, and a personal memoir. These all use sequential art, okay? Multiple panels telling a story. There's a point to the sequence, but the content, is very, very different. 
and the content between cast for friendly ghosts fantasy and personal memoir wildly different and because the content of the story is different it will affect the art it will affect the color it will affect the style of drawing it will affect the way the page is laid out and that's because of the content not because of what we call it so my first aha moment was separate the format from the content okay the format of boxes with art and words and dialogue balloons okay separated from the content content can be rich it can be true stories or it can be trashy right it's still using a format of art but the content is different so the graphic novel is not really its own genre of book it's the format that the author chooses to tell the story and the word graphic novel is kind of odd because a novel implies fiction and this is not fiction this is a memoir so we might call it a graphic memoir. Again, graphic novel, graphic memoir, they're often used interchangeably to speak about a book like this that tells a true story in sequential art format. Hope that makes sense. That was my first aha. Okay, but why would an author choose this format okay they want to have a story to tell why would they choose to do it this way so the first thing i want to do is i want to look at the preface for the best we could do because t Bowie actually tells us why she chose this format she says the seeds of this book were planted around 2002 when i was a graduate student and took a detour from my art education training to get lost in the world of oral history. Oh, just an aside, she was a graduate student at Bard College in sculpture. So she's got root, some roots here in the Hudson Valley. So back to the oral history. The transcripts of my family's stories and the clumsy homemade book that I produced from that time were more meaningful than any art that I had made before. I was trying to understand the forces that caused my family in the late 70s to flee one country and start over in another. And I titled my project, The Booze in Vietnam and America, A Memory Reconstruction. It had photographs, it had some art, but mostly writing and it was pretty academic. However, I didn't feel like I had solved the storytelling problem of how to present history in a way that is human and relatable and not oversimplified. And I thought of turning it into a graphic novel would help. Um, and then later on in the preface, she says, in 2011, when I was reorganizing my life so that my aging parents could be more involved in it, I realized the book that the book was really about parents and children, and it became the best we could do. So she started on a journey of, of talking with her parents to, to collect their stories, their dramatic stories of what they experienced in Vietnam, why they left, how they left, and how they reestablished themselves in America. And, and she wanted to share that story, but she, as an artist, felt compelled to include photographs and art in her storytelling. Okay, so can any of you relate to this? Let's use some photographs in telling a story okay are there any similarities maybe to those photo albums that you have sitting at home or how about a shutterfly photo book 
or a scrapbook. Isn't this, okay, here's a family vacation shutterfly book that my daughter made about a, a family trip. Isn't this just a graphic memoir? It's a collection of stories, or a collection of, of photographs, I'm sorry. There is a purposeful sequence from beginning to end, and there are some descriptor words, right? We do it all the time. We make sequential art memoirs. We put our baby photos together. We put the captions in about developmental milestones. We do it for our trip photos. We put in captions about the food and the events and things that happened. And it turns out we've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Scott McLeod brings up some history that I found fascinating. Cortez discovered, quote unquote, discovered a pre-Columbian picture manuscript in 1519. It's 36 feet long and it's brightly colored and it's painted. And you see these little lines here? Don't they kind of look like the lines between the boxes in a, in a comic book? This is a historical representation of a battle. And it's in sequential art format. Even before that, the French Bayou Tapestry is a recording of the Norman Conquest. It's 230 feet long. It's a tapestry of pictures and some words right in here. And it's telling a story. And we might think about the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. That might seem to fit our definition as well, except Interestingly, these really aren't pictures of, well, this doesn't have a plot line because what these are is actually words. They, have, they represent sounds. So in other words, <laughs> this is actually dialogue. Okay, these are words. Yes, it tells a story, but it's not a pictorial image the same way as this is ancient Egyptian painting from 1300 BC. And Scott McCloud studied this and eventually realized that yes, there is a purpose to this sequence and you start in the lower left and you read it this way. It's just like comics. Here are the harvesters. They put their grain into this uh, basket and off they go. They they dump it here at the threshing area and they bring the cattle to walk on it to help kind of separate the grains. And here they're winnowing it in, in a, a group. They're measuring and packaging up their grains. They're going to haul it away and everybody has to pay their taxes on there or they get beaten if they don't pay their taxes. I mean, this is, to me, this just blew me away. I had no idea that this kind of sequential art format had been used for eons. That to me is kind of exciting. So sequential art in many mediums. So we've already seen uh, tapestry and paintings. There's also Trajan's column, there's Greek paintings, there's Japanese scrolls, they're all sequential art. Now, where do you, where did comics begin? He says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to figure that one out. But the next step that happens is invention of printing, which pushes comics forward dramatically. In 1460, this is a page that was printed of sequential art, of the torture of St. Erasmus. Oh my, poor fellow. And 1731, William Hogarth had such exquisite uh, engravings that his artwork was printed and hung in galleries, but they were designed to be hung sequentially because there was a storyline. And 
copyright laws were invented or written to protect this new art form of sequential art. In the mid 1800s, Rudolf Topfer added, brought satire and word blocks and picture into his pictures, also caricatures, which the British caricature magazines kept building and building and building until we get to the 20th century where there's just this explosion of what we understand today as being comics. But I think McLeod's point here is it didn't start here, right? This is building on a history, a long history of an art form. Now it gets kind of kooky and crazy here, but before that, it was quite different. So who's to say it can't change dramatically again? So he also goes on to say that some of the most inspired and innovative comics of the 20th century never got the recognition. Here's one I love, The Snowman. How many of you have read The Snowman? It's a beautiful children's book, has no words. It's just sequential art that tells a story of, of the snowman. Um, but comics had such a negative connotation that many of these artists who he's, I, I don't know what all these references are, but he's saying a lot of these practitioners were preferred to be known as illustrators or commercial artists. They didn't want to be affiliated with comics. So. Yeah, comics had an interesting past. Where is it going? So let's look at our definition of sequential art. And this time, the secret is not in what the definition says, but what it doesn't say. For example, the definition of sequential art doesn't say anything about it has to have superheroes, or it has to have funny animals, or it's about fantasy or science fiction. It can be about anything. There are no genres or subject matters. There's no um, even medium that are restricted. It's just simply sequential art. So it could be completely online, created completely online, sequential art. It fits the definition. There's no mention of black lines or colored art or whatever. There's no boundaries to sequential art. So the future is wide open. Okay, so I've been rambling now for 20, 25 minutes. Let's just take a minute to talk about, uh, let's see if I can get out of this and get back to our view of, here we are. Okay, and we have Diane in the room as well. Diane Kloss, a different Diane. So how, you know, has this, changed your impression of what the graphic novel is? Any thoughts about what we've talked about so far? Anybody? <laughs> yes, go ahead, Linda. Hi. Um when I was young, I um, read all like the Archie comics and, um, you know, like the superhero comics and stuff like that. And they were really fun and enjoyable. But again, they were the kind of things that, you know, you would read and then you would kind of toss away. You know, they weren't anything back then that was long lasting. They were just like a fun little thing to read. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I was in school um, in like the 70s and 80s, you know, that was never considered any serious reading. Yeah. And um, I think that it's been so great to see um, the uh, comic form used as a vehicle to tell really serious stories. And the idea that you can present that in art and language at the same time, to me is just wonderful. And I've I read a lot of graphic novels and graphic memoirs and stuff like that. 
um, you know, and I still keep up with Marvel and DC and, you know, that's fun, but um, it's amazing the way artists um, and storytellers can present their stories in the graphic form. I think it's just so innovative and it can be so relatable to people if they will give it a chance. Um, and it's kind of sad that, you know, in the past, you know, the people who were creating comics were doing amazing work, but, you know, kind of like the Pulp Fiction novels or whatever, you know, they were not considered anything that was a, uh, you know, of importance. Mm -hmm. And now we're finally, you know, in later decades, we're finally understanding like, you know, the Pulp Fiction, um, Raymond Chandler and stuff is really great work. And we can do the same thing with graphic novels. We can see how that art form is really amazing work. So I think it's great that we're doing this for the big read because I think that people really need to learn to appreciate if they haven't had a chance to um, experience the graphic form. The best we can do is a great example of it. Thank you. Thanks. Is it usually the case where the illustrator and the storyteller are the same person? Is that a characteristic of the graphic novel? Yeah, I think it's fairly common. Um, and uh, particularly, I think, for our um, graphic uh, memoirs, that people who want to tell their story in this format, they will do it um, by drawing themselves. Yeah. Okay. I, I have to say, when okay. I first... Sorry, just, just a real quick comment uh, from Diane in the room here. She said it can be a collaborative process. Okay. Um, yeah, it definitely can be. I remember reading an article recently of, of uh, a man who wanted to tell his story and was a good friend with a cartoonist and they collaborated and, and worked it out together. Yes, I'm sorry, Marcia, go ahead. No, I have to say when I first read, you know, the best we could do, I read it just as if it were a novel and the words, and I hated it. I did, I did because I couldn't get everything that was in there. Then I took it, went back, and I had to take it apart and separate the words and, and the art and then kind of reconstruct it for me to read it mm -hmm. again. And, and that's, I had to do that because I was so used to just reading the words and not really paying attention to the art, but you can't separate the two. Interesting. Yes. Thank you, Marcia. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Linda. You know, it's really interesting to me that like when most of us learn how to read when we're very, very young. It's with picture books. And, yeah. you know, when we're really little kids, it's great for us to be shown pictures and then read the words, you know, the words are read to us. Mm -hmm. And that's most of how we are, learn how to read. Um, and then somehow there's a drop off. Mm -hmm. And it's all of a sudden, it's like, okay, now you're too old for these pictures. And you can only read words. And, and no illustrations, or as you see, like the, the middle grade books and the easy reader books, they have less and less and less illustrations until by the time you get to like junior high or high school, it's all words and no pictures, you know? So it's, it's interesting how our society has given like, you know, oh, the gravitas to only words, you know? And those are the important books and all the words and picture books are for like children or they're not really important. So I think it's, again, it's really great that we have that form that can just go throughout somebody's whole life because art is just as important as words in telling a story. So. Thank you. Yes, Diane.
Okay, so Diane is, I have to repeat because I know the microphone doesn't pick up very well. Uh, Melanie last week was commenting about taking your time to read panel by panel and, and just letting it kind of sink in as you go along rather than just focusing on the words and read, 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 yeah. you know. It, there's something really unique about, about taking your time with each panel and yeah. Age, I would think that that's a hard conversion if you're used to just reading novels. It is for me. I, I, I don't, I mean, I've, I've read more and I do enjoy graphic novels now, but it's still certainly not what I would choose. First, I would still choose to read a book with just words. <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, like Linda's saying, why, why do we say that that's the epitome? I, you know, it, it's very interesting. So I'm rethinking, but yeah, it is hard. It is hard to make that, that leap. And I certainly have had, had plenty of people say to me, eh, I don't think I'm gonna read this big read book. <laughs> I, I mean, it is, it's hard. It's hard to make that, that switch. Diane uh, Rain, did you want to add anything before we move on? Okay. All right. Um, anybody have anything else they want to add before we go back into? Okay. So let me just make sure I can get back to my presentation here. Okay. So, yes, um, if you have questions, um, I, I, you know, feel free to jot them down because we are gonna have a time at the end where I, I wanna hear your questions of what else do you wanna know? What else do you wanna think about? What else do you wanna talk about? So, so far I've uh, covered bits of chapter one and McLeod's book, there are nine chapters. We're not gonna do all nine. So one thing that I think is helpful, however, which Melanie did touch on last week is just a few tips on how to read the graphic memoir. So just to talk about what is a panel, what order do you read it in, what's narration, what's dialogue, thought, and the gutter. So I'm gonna take a page here. Let me get rid of this box. Um, and this is a page from or the best we could do. So each one of these is a panel. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven panels on this page. We start up here in the upper right. We read across just like a book. When you're done, you go down to the next line, just read across and down and read across. Now, what's in this first panel is a narration box. And then Bo was let go from his job. That's the narrator speaking to you in the narration box. The next panel has a circle with a little line that indicates that this person over here is speaking. I think you'd be good material for the new economic zone. The next one has narration, but it doesn't exactly have a box around it. She uses different styles so sometimes the narration will have a box, sometimes it won't, but you get the idea that this is a narration. This is the narrator because there's, it's not a bubble. It's not attributed to any person. The new economic zones were where they pushed those they didn't trust to do hard labor in rural isolation. In the next one, there's the, the narration. Now this time the narration is just floating in the air around the same time, the currency change. But there's also dialogue. The dialogue comes in two almost distinct bubbles. It's interesting. Those bastards, no matter how much you exchange, all you get back is 200 yong. Okay, to me, this first part, dot, 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 is a little break that is sort of, to me, maybe an emotional break before, the dialogue picks back up here on all you get back. Kind of like, no matter how much you exchange, all you get back. It, it, that's how I interpret it. 
Now it may just be that she was trying to fit it all in between her two pictures and she did it that way. I don't know. In this panel, there's two people speaking. This one is attributed to Ma. That was all we had. And now it feeds our family for less than a month. And one that's attributed to Ma. I'm going out and need a smoke. Then here's a narration panel. I think Ma felt left alone to provide for our family. And in the last panel, we got some funky narration and we have some thought bubbles. These little bubbles here indicate that this is a thought in his head. He's not saying there's no future here. Even my kids won't be able to get uh, more than a sixth grade education. Those are his thoughts. But what's this? Well, it seems like here's a dot, dot, dot from what she is thinking, the, not thinking, excuse me, what the narrator is telling us about this situation. I think Ma felt left alone to provide. And here the narrator continues, dot, 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 while Ba retreated into a deep depression for which Ma had no sympathy. I, I got it. And they kind of imagine this as maybe the cloud of depression hanging over him. She just somehow felt from an artist's point of view, she couldn't, she couldn't talk about depression in, in, a, in a nice, neat, square geometric box. It somehow had to be different. And then the last part is the gutters in between, these white lines in between, okay? These spaces are called the gutters. So, yeah, what about the gutter? Well, McLeod says, you see my speech bubble there? Get that? <laughs> Despite its unceremonious title, the gutter plays host to much of the magic and mystery that are at the very heart of comics. It is here that the human imagination takes two separate images and transforms them into a single idea. Really? In the gutter? Well, okay, I don't know. If we look at this picture, and then we look at this picture, what happens in between here? Well, not a whole lot, except the perspective changes, right? Here, in the first picture, it's a close-up of Ba. In the second picture, it's like the camera pulls back for a long shot and here's the boss saying, nope, got to let you go off to the new economic zone for you. I don't know. I don't know that any much else happens, but I understand that. My brain can make that leap from panel one to panel two. From panel two to panel three, across the gutter, what does my brain do? My brain gets, mm, I don't know what a new economic zone is. Oh, here it is. This is what it is. Now, I don't think that this person is this person and this person is this person. My brain says, yeah, it's just a little explanation I'm getting of what the economic zone is. We don't, so in other words, I don't really think about what happens in my brain between the panels. But I think there is a point that your brain is engaged in a way that's kind of creative and interesting. Another example is with peekaboo. So babies, infants, can't, you can't play peekaboo with them because once they don't see your face, they think you're gone. It doesn't register to them. There's a certain de developmental period to which all of a sudden they get it. But just because you hold up the blanket doesn't mean you went away. You're still there and you can play peekaboo with them. I learned that as permanence, that a baby develops a sense of permanence. Um, the cloud calls it closure. So there's something that's going on in between the peekaboo and the peekaboo. There's hiding. In other words, comic panels fracture time and space and offer 
a jagged staccato rhythm of unconnected moments, but our brain allows us to connect them. So I wanna know, is anybody willing to connect these and tell me the story that you think these five separate panels tell us? Just go ahead and jump in. Unmute yourself and tell me the story. What do you think is happening here? Oh, come on, somebody take a stab at it. <laughs> All right, so Diane says he's walking, then he, he stops and sees something that's impressing him on the ground. He's excited. He bends down to get it and, oh, it was disappointing, somewhat disappointing. <laughs> All right, I like that story. Okay, who else wants to tell the story? It can be different. What else? I think the person is walking and then they stop to sort of stretch. This is coming from someone who has back problems. <laughs> <laughs> they stop to stretch a little bit um, in three different directions and then they're kind of ready to move on. Oh, lovely. Okay, <laughs> very nice. Who else wants to take a stab at it? All right, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I think it is. I think the first guy is walking on stage from behind the curtain. He takes a slight bow. He then presents a monologue from Othello. And then the crowd goes wild and he takes a deep, deep bow and is very proud of himself. But see, our brains concocted some way to connect these pictures, right? We didn't need all the individual um, uh, it, it, panels in between to make it happen. Okay, so let's get real. Isn't reading a regular book just plain better? What can sequential art offer us? So I wanna just show you a few examples from Mouse which is the, the first, I'll be honest with you, which is the first graphic novel that I read that just knocked my socks off. And Persepolis, which I found to be very impressive as well. Both of them are um, true stories. Um, we're gonna uh, just quickly review the five reasons that Melanie Klein gave us last week for reading sequential art. And a few pages, we're gonna look at a few pages from the best we could do. So when I read, um, Mouse by Art Spiegelman. I could not get over the fact that I just opened the book and started reading and there these characters were mice. All the Jews were mice. And then when the Nazis showed up, the mice, uh, the, they, were, they were drawn as cats. <laughs> Never says anything in the book about the fact that he drew them as mice or he drew the Nazis as cats. He just did it. And to me, that's just brilliant because it adds depth to the characters that the, the Nazis, the, the cats are out to get the mice, right? To me, this is where I start thinking about that old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm. And when um, Spiegelman is telling the story of, of uh, he was, he, this is a, a train in Poland, I approached the train man who was a Pole. Well, he's drawn as a pig. And down here, the narrator says, I still had on my army uniform and I didn't let know I was a Jew. So in other words, his army uniform disguised him enough Plus, he didn't have a star on his, on his um, sleeve. This was early enough. Plus, maybe he did something to his voice or the way he spoke. But in the picture, he puts on a mask so that he looks like a pig. You're a pole like me, so I trust you. The stinking Nazis had me in a war prison, okay? I just think that's really, really clever that we're, 
not only are we getting the description, but we're also getting a very clever representation. A picture can also bring clarity very, very quickly. This is a part of the story where this is Art Spiegelman right here in the trench coat and the cigarette. And this is his dad. And his dad's telling him about the kitchen where, they, where he had made a hole to go down into the cellar. It was four feet wide. Uh, and there we made a brick wall, filled it high with coal behind the wall. I, I can't have any, I don't have any visual understanding of what that is, except for, see this lovely drawing right here? This is what he's working on as he's talking. And then we get to see it right here, the tablet with the drawing. So here's the coal bin in the kitchen. It has a false bottom. It has a removable panel where people could crawl in. It's bolted to the floor that hides the opening to go down into the bunker. The bunker is created in the basement by this false wall that's piled up with coal. Boom. I can visualize that. I can visualize people crawling through, crawling down, hiding in there while their place is searched and coming back out again. I mean, that's just brilliant. Pictures also pack a punch emotionally. I could look at that picture and I did. I looked at that picture for a long time. This is from Persepolis. Trying to understand, am I supposed to be able to tell which one is her? Or is that part of the point? Is that you can't tell which one is her? This is a story about coming of age in Iran under the first Ayatollah and the changes that the, so the society went through moving to a um, rigid religious uh, society. And she says here, I agreed with my mother. I too tried to think only of life. However, it wasn't easy. They lined us up at school twice a day to mourn the war dead. They put on funeral marches and we had to beat our breasts. There are the girls beating their breasts in unison. I just think that's terrifically powerful. And I don't get that from the words. I think it's, I think it's much more powerful in the drawing. These are Melanie's um, five reasons for reading graphic novels. Comics make space in reading for silence. Kind of like here. Just taking time to look at the picture, to meditate on what, what it represents. Comics can communicate complex ideas almost instantaneously through visual metaphor or through diagrams like the Art Spiegelman one. We'll look at a metaphor shortly. Comics can use words and images as two separate tracks to complement or contradict each other which is really unusual and would be very difficult to do in, um, in a novel. In comics, space and time can play in unique ways. We'll look at an example of that. And comics are one of the most democratic and accessible of art forms. I think because anybody can draw them and anybody can read them. Um, is where she's coming from when she talks about the most yes, uh, democratic because the drawings don't have to be real sophisticated. You don't have to be a great artist to pull this off. So this is one page from the best we could do. It doesn't have a lot of words. They're kind of desperate at this point, um, floating around, um, trying to make their escape out of Vietnam. And there's just one word, fisherman, exclamation point from the boat. So what else is going on here? Well, obviously these are the fishermen. Maybe the fishermen don't, don't speak the same language. So he's gesturing, follow me or, or over there, go over there. But I just, I just love the, the beauty of the simplicity and the beauty of that drawing. I just think the boat is so neat. 
gives us time to just rest and think what it would have been like and the joy of seeing two other people on the water besides this one lonely boat that they were on. Okay, if you have the book, don't turn to it. Because <laughs> I want to just read this to you. And, and, and then we wanna, I want to ask you about the difference between reading the words and reading the words with the art. I'm on page 36, but don't look at it yet. Soon after that trip back to Vietnam, our first since we escaped in 1978, I began to record our family history thinking that if I bridged the gap between the past and the present, I could fill the void between my parents and me. And that if I could see Vietnam as a real place and not a symbol of something lost, I would see my parents as real people and learn to love them better. Mm. I think those are beautiful, beautiful words, mm -hmm. very powerful. And then we add the drawings. Mm. Here she is collecting the stories. And in the background, very faintly, is a boat with some waves. Okay, part of the oral history. But here, if I could see Vietnam as a real place and not a symbol of something lost. So this blotch, that's Vietnam, map of Vietnam. I would see my parents as real people and learn to love them better. And what is this? To me, that's the reflection, right? The, that's Vietnam also, the map. But it's going the other way. Why? Why on this naked body? I have to just ponder that. It's a powerful image. Just trying to figure some things out here. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Anybody want to share anything that they take away from this page? From the art? And how it relates to her words? I saw that even though she went back to Vietnam to, to try and connect with her parents, she still, she still was not able to. Mm -hmm. That's how I read it mm -hmm. and saw it. Mm -hmm. There was something that still divided and kept them apart. Mm -hmm. Not having read it, it looks to me like she's taking a piece of Vietnam with her wherever she goes. Mm. I think it is imprinted on her by her parents' yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. And maybe not a very positive imprint. No. Yeah. Right? It almost seems like a, a burn or a, or, or a scar or something. Did anybody else think about that very famous picture of the running naked girl, the napalm girl? Yes. Oh. That came to my mind as well. That picture was taken from the front, but could this be the back? I mean, is she trying to tell us something more here? Anybody else have any observations you wanna share? All right, the very next page, I think it's interesting to look at these two pages side by side. The very next page continues this watery background here as this is T as a T buoy as an adult. I ask them endless questions about their lives, the war and the country that was once was home. To me, the way she drew this sort of feels like she's on a boat in the mm -hmm. ocean. I mean, these planks and these planks, it, it just sort of feels like they're sort of adrift, right? Because the background is all water. 
But Ma, always the practical one, would rather that we laughed more and went shopping together. Okay, back to reality. Back to reality here. Now there's a background of, a, of an apartment. She humors me with stories and then says, what should we do about dinner? I think the art adds to this particular sequence. Mm -hmm. Talking about the way time um, can play with um, reality here. I think this is a nice example. The chaos of getting in and out of Los Angeles when they made the trip. Her mother spoke English. Um, and here she's looking in two directions and she's speaking here to this person. She's speaking here. She, and um, these people are speaking to her. Is this all happening at once? Well, pretty close to it, right? You get a sense of a lot of stress and pressure, time, time pressure. Right? And then what are these words floating up here? Custom, baggage, connecting flights. Well, I, you know, this is often uh, a tool that's used for sound effects in comics, just to have these uh, large words kind of hanging in the air. Um, they may be coming through the speakers or they may be on visual, um, you know, hang, hanging down visual uh, displays. But there's pressure somehow that it's, 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 you know, weighing on them. And the poor little kids, they're just kind of lost in this, right? She's a little bit off kilter with her feet. I, I just think that the drawing really gives you that sense of urgency and panic. And then after helping everybody else, Ma realized, oh no, our flight is about to leave and she takes off running and the kids have to run to keep up. This is an interesting design of a page. This little face peeking out between these panels and these panels. It's not in a panel. It's somehow like hiding behind the panels. What is she trying to tell us about this sweet little girl? Look at the top panels. They taught us to be respectful, to take care of one another, and to do well in school. Those were the intended lessons that her parents taught her. The unintentional ones come from their unexorcised -ex demons and from the habits they formed over so many years of trying to survive. See the background here, are all light, very respectful and clean. These backgrounds, very dark. The smoke, the cigarette smoke is a continuing theme throughout the, the book. The real contrast between what they taught, the intended lessons they taught, and the unintentional lessons that came through. I, I, what do you think this little girl is about? Do you think these are tears? Do you think these are sort of blank eyes? Do you think it's fear? What, what, do, you, what do you see here in this, this center peeking through? Combination. She's trying to take it all in. That's what Diane says here. She's trying to take it all in. Okay, good. Yeah, what else? Anybody else? Walking a fine um, line. Okay, yes, go ahead. It's interesting that the, um, the gutters between the top uh, three panels are dark. Yeah. Um, and that seems like she's really internalizing the messages, but she's, you know, the, the, her eyes then in the next panel at the, the middle, um, you know, she's internalizing these messages, but she's not really sure about them. She's a little anxious about them. That's what I see in her eyes, like anxiety or, you know, a little bit of fear. Yeah. And, and the gutters, especially between the, the top three. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, instead of like the plain white gutters, there's a darkness there. So 
you know, what she's learning is, is, you know, a good thing, but in the same time, there's a darkness there. Yeah, it's very much tainted by the, by the darkness. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, so this brings us to the end, the best we could do. Like I said earlier, there are 50 copies of the book going into circulation by the end of the week. Um, big Read starts October 8 and 9, and we, we're doing actually a big weekend, a kickoff weekend. We're going to have a Friday night lecture. We're going to have three workshops on Saturday, a morning workshop about storytelling, a one o'clock workshop with a, with a graphic artist, and a three o'clock workshop with two Marist scholars to talk about the history. Uh, T. Bowie herself is planning on coming Sunday, October 17th. <laughs> here to uh, Boardman Road as long as uh, COVID allows. If uh, she cannot come in person, if it does not seem advisable, she will still join us by Zoom. Um, she is in California, yeah. Um, there are many book discussions, food programs, lectures, films, um, all kinds of stuff in the planning between eight libraries and six school districts and um, all kinds of good stuff happening. So the information will be uh, online and in print by the beginning of September. So you can plan your weeks of big read. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, nope, nope, there we go. So, I'm happy at this point to just hear any kind of reflections or insights or questions that you want to share before we close. And I will say, I, I will say that um, as I was preparing for tonight, I decided that a lot of the technical stuff that I had thought I was going to share from Scott McLeod's book, I decided was really not maybe all that interesting to people who aren't into graphic novels. I mean, if you're into it, it's fascinating. But if you're not, it really isn't all that important. And so I don't know that I have enough material to have another program next week. Unless you have questions or things you want to talk about or want me to talk about next week. So I am willing to do another program next week, but I would like some input. So what do you have for me? Can I just comment on, on one thing on the book? The coloring in that, the, the, in the art was really, really got to me. I think how it really, to me, the coloring she used was very emotional for some reason mm -hmm. to me. And, and that really came across, mm -hmm. it was, it was kind of melancholy throughout the whole thing. Yes. But it was, it was very poignant. Mm -hmm. It really did set a tone. Oh, yep. definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say, um, this was a great presentation, Jewel. And um, I really do think that, um, it's not necessarily about like the technical um, aspects of graphic novels and memoirs, but the emotional aspects behind them. And if people can, um, you know, open themselves up to the illustrative way of telling a story, they can get just as much out of that story as if they're just reading just a plain, you know, not a plain, but you know, I mean, a, a, a literary words novel. But the um, the addition of illustrations can add so much to the emotional impact of a story, and I think that's why um, things like Mouse or Persepolis 
or George Takei's um, memoir, you know, The Best We Can Do, all these graphic memoirs especially can really bring across a lot of emotion with their pictures that you may not actually be able to envision because it's something that's different from what we as Westerners, Americans are used to seeing. Um, and then just seeing it represented graphically can just really, um, you know, give that extra emotional impact. So I think that, um, you know, I'd love to see more people take a chance on the graphic novel form because it's just amazing. And I'm so happy to see that there's so many more graphic novels um, that are being put out. Mm -hmm. So there's, I mean, this is just a great um, way of introducing people to it if they're not really used to it. And then it's like a great jumping off point to so much rich, rich graphic novel literature that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it is pretty remarkable how many memoirs are coming out in the graphic format. It, it's just, it just seems to be exploding. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Jewel. It was wonderful. Oh, Diane says like, she can't imagine what, how much more we could say <laughs> <laughs> at, at another session. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I was going to do the third one because I thought there was so much material in Scott McLeod's book that I wanted to share. Um, you know, like literally we only touched on chapter one and part of chapter two out of nine. But as I really got into it and realized how much of it was so very technical and focused on aspects that really didn't necessarily enrich my understanding of the best we could do, I decided that I needed to really just focus on what was the most germane to this book. And so that's what I tried to do. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody else have anything, any questions or any other thoughts you want to share? Okay. Well, I, I encourage you all to um, be reading graphic memoirs because I think once you get a taste for one I definitely would recommend Mouse. I definitely would recommend Persepolis. Um, it, 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 I think it, it helps to understand even the best we could do it, by reading somebody else's and, and then going, oh yeah, okay, this is how somebody tells their own story and, and how they represent it in words and pictures. Okay, we got it. And, and Diane is reiterating what Marcia said, train mm -hmm. ourselves not to rush through the words. Right. Just rush through the whole thing. Yep. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. I will let you know when the recording is available. You can share it with friends. Um, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.